everyone, and welcome to the Noman live stream live on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. I want to thank you for joining us. And I know what you're thinking. Who is that man on the other side of the camera that looks like a combination between Harrison Ford and current Peter Jackson? Well, my name is Chris Holly, and I'll be your host for this evening. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say, if you're looking for closed captioning, go ahead and head over to our Facebook, uh, where we're streaming live, and there's closed captioning there. Uh, I'd also like to take this time to thank Lenovo, our wonderful sponsor. Without them, we wouldn't be able to provide you all with amazing content. And speaking of amazing content, ha ha have you all heard about this new uh, animated series, Spider-Man Freshman Year? It's, it's going to be on Disney Plus. And, and speaking of things that are great on Disney Plus, if you haven't, you should watch Book of Boba Fett. It's fantastic. And Mandalorian. Well, Chris, why are you saying all this? What do these three things have in common? Well, I think to help us with that, I'll bring in our guest, Daniel Zenny. Daniel, good to have you. Hey, Chris. How's it going? Thank you for the intro. That was beautiful. It's going I'm going to put it I'm put in front of my demo reel. It's going to be great. <laughs> So you and I were talking a little bit earlier. Um, we, you know, went over manga and, and Demon Slayer and Yu Yu Hakusho and, and all kinds of stuff. But for those who don't know, uh, why don't you tell them a little bit about you? Well, I'm a 3D character artist, uh, Noman graduate, uh, and I've been working in the industry for about six years now. Very cool. And working in the industry as a Noman graduate, that's got a... It has a little, little, little bit of good feel with it, right? I mean, you got to be in this amazing campus back here that I'm currently in. Uh, but going into Noman, did you did you do any art beforehand, or did you just like come in and you were like, I I'm here at Noman, and and now I'm gonna start my art? It was a long journey. I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, it all started. I'm gonna go way back, and if I ramble too much, just like cut me off. Um, no, no, let's hear it. <laughs> uh, so, so when I was a kid. I grew up in Orlando, Florida, and uh, this is the time when Disney was like pumping out VHS tapes, right? They were making lots of money with that. <laughs> <laughs> and my cousin worked at Disney, and so she would give me all the VHS tapes. And on the flip side of that, uh, we had a TV, but it had like three channels and two of them were fuzzy. So I was raised on animation. It, I, if it had people in it, like real people, I wouldn't watch it. I hated it. Uh, I, so I've there. been a proponent of that as well. Yeah. Okay. Right, so like, right. you get what I'm talking about. Uh, and I yeah. would like, if you ask my mom, she would say that like, I would grab the VHS tapes and like a piece of paper and I would draw the cover. So I've been drawing since I was like four. Um, but then, you know, in high school, right, it's like 10th grade. It's time for me to start thinking about what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'd never done any research on the animation, animation industry, had no idea what it was about. And the minute I started looking, it was like, Disney closes Florida studio and Michael Eisner says, we're not going to make any more traditionally animated films. And I was like, Ooh. Oh, cool, <laughs> dude. I'm, I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I stumble through my life essentially. Um, so I was about 21 and I started to teach myself how to draw. Right. I was drawn. I was joining online communities like daily speed paint and 10,000 hours, which I still post to today. Uh, and, some of the conversations they would have would be, should you go to school or should you stay at home and teach yourself? And like the pros and cons and all that. Obviously, one being, do you want to pay a bunch of money? But then also you get like, you know, teachers that work in the industry. And on the side of going to school, there was like three or four schools that they'd always bring up, right? Um, Art Center, uh, Feng Zhu School in Singapore, and then Noman School of Visual Effects. And at the time... I had no idea what 3D was, right? I mean, I literally had no idea what 3D was at all in any sense. Um, so I go to the page and right in the front, it's like 90 something percent job rate after graduation. And I was like, what? Because you see, when I was growing up, like it was like starving artists. It was so complicated and difficult to like get my parents and my friends to understand that like you can actually make money as an artist. And on oh, top yeah. of that, 3D is a technical skill. So I ran to my parents and said, look, these people are getting jobs after they graduate. And on top of that, it's a technical skill that I can like learn, right? So long story, medium size, because I did talk a lot, but I put, they, they, they approved. <laughs> and then I, you know, I put together a portfolio, packed up my car and drove all the way from Florida to Los Angeles and started my journey there. 
Well, wait, hang on. So real quick, you literally got into Nomen and then traveled across the nation. And then, so you were going to school and then you also, was this the first time, were you living in your parents' house and then you moved in on your, on, on your own or like by yourself? Uh, yeah, actually, I mean, that's, it's really interesting you mentioned that wow. because I was like a mama's boy. I, my mom did everything for me. And so it was, everything was new to me. It was so difficult. I never lived on my own. I had never cooked for myself. I, it's a little embarrassing, but essentially like I, I did nothing. I was a child, I was a man child <laughs> it was and then. I had it to grow up. Yeah, exactly. It was like, you know, eight years ago, but it was, so it was, it was a very uh, difficult learning process for me. And you're like 2000 miles away from your family, your friends. I didn't know anybody there. It was, it was crazy. Yeah, but then some people uh, at Nomen are, are even further. But so that's actually oh, yes, kind of a, a, a cool thing to know that you not only took that leap, but as we are here now, you've succeeded uh, on that leap. So then you go to Nomen, uh, you have the experience here. And how, how was your overall experience at Nomen? Nomen is amazing. I mean, it, it it is essentially the Hogwarts of schools. It is so cool. And like you said, and I guess Hogwarts is kind of the same, where like we are all so far away from our family. We're doing this thing that's really difficult. And you know, like in school where it's like, like there's two or three kids that are smart and they get A's and then everyone else slacks off and like, who cares? Nomen yeah. is the opposite. I mean, if there's one kid and he's slacking, like that's the person that everyone notices. We didn't even look at our grades because everyone was working so hard that grades, what do you mean? We're working so hard. We got the A, that's not important. We're trying to get our stuff on best of term. We're trying to get our art posted all over the walls. Like that's what it was like. And you're all in that struggle together, right? Like you're in boot camp, So you form these lifelong friendships and then, you know, you help each other get jobs. It's, I mean, I, it, no one is the best decision I've ever made in my life. It's, it's, it's really strange because every time we ask someone a question like that, they give a similar answer and everyone's like, oh, you know, it, you, you must queue them up. But we literally were, uh, we were in backstage talking about anime before we got on here. So that was, that was all you. We didn't talk I anything mean, about I, Nomen, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's very convincing to people. So, okay, you go to Nomen and then afterwards you... I mean, one of the reasons why you came here was the the, the placement, and you get it, and you get a, you get a right. job. So, how has your career been since uh, since coming here? Uh, it's been well. To go back a little bit too, I like when I got to uh, to Nome, and I want I, I realized that like oh Disney still makes movies, and but they're three D now. Uh, and I got there, and I was like, I want to be a character artist for animation. And it was kind of weird because students are so scared of not getting jobs that that's all they care about. I mean, it really is the focus of their attention. Um, and so I'd say, I want to be a character artist. And someone would say, oh, you know what? There's more work for environment art. And I'd go, oh, okay. And then they'd be like, you know what? Environment for games, way more work. And don't get me wrong, environments are amazing. And if you're passionate about that's wonderful. But I kind of like, it, it's weird because, you know, I was so passionate. I took this huge risk. I came across the country. And then even all the way there, I was still kind of taking shortcuts and being like, no, uh, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I should go in this direction. Um, and then, so sorry, p going towards my career, um, I yeah. in my employer preview day is when you get to show your work and employers come around. My plaque said environment for games, Daniel Zenny. Uh, and uh, Pauly Schreer from General Giant Studios walked around and he looked at my environments and he said, it says environment artist, but it looks like you like to sculpt. And he was right, because when I would ever I pick a concept, I would always make sure that the concept had something sculpture in it, right? like a statue or um, like I did a graveyard, but I had a nun and then like a crazy tree that I got to sculpt. Or um, I did a temple, but there was guards like that, you know, so it was really like I hid yeah. characters in my environments. Um, and so when when he, he offered me a full time job before I graduated and I said, oh, wow, this is it. I did it. I got the job. And so that like all of a sudden it was like, oh, I got the job. But oh, man, I really wanted to be a character artist. Why did I diverge? Like, why did I do that? And so I spent the first year out of school working on a brand new portfolio. And that year I made like 12 or 13 characters. I posted 13 times. And ever since then, I've been working in characters, whether it be consumer products, uh, video games, uh, animation, uh, live action, printing, you know, just all over the place, but in characters. So I've, I've had a really wonderful career so far. No, not to not to diverge too much, but do you think that was the catalyst of the character thing for you, like somebody coming and pointing that out, or had it always been around? Like it was just 
you taking that VHS Daniel Zenny and then just making it into 3D because a lot of those VHSs, they're they're I mean, not to not to date myself, but if any of y'all get a chance to get yourself your hands on a Disney VHS, you'll notice two things. It's very squeaky when it opens, made of plastic <laughs> and then very puffy. Um, but there are characters on the front. You know, right. so if oh. you were if you were drawing and, and tracing that, I mean, you were that was kind of a, a piece of, of what you really enjoyed. Did you feel that that was like a natural evolution for you or did somebody have to point it out like, hey, you like characters in order for you to really get into it? No. Yeah. I, so another thing, too, is that like I wasn't that technical at school. Like if there was a technical class, I just I had a hard time for some reason. And then after your first year, if you're doing the two year program, which I, I think now they have a bachelor's and it's. It's more complex than just two year, three year. Um, but after the first year, you start ZBrush. And for the first time, I think we got to sculpt a skull from like a sphere. And for the first time, I was like, oh, like I'm pretty good. Like I'm pretty good at this. Like usually I was like <laughs> bottom of the pack. I was always struggling to like, you know, do something good. And then I was the one being be like, oh, Daniel, could you like help me with my skull a little bit? And I was like, oh, oh I'm good at something. Thank you. Uh, so uh, yeah, def I mean, like, like I said, I've been drawing my whole life. Um, I just, finding that like it's that hurdle to get into becoming a professional artist and not just you know some kid drawing superheroes kind of thing so then you start on the disney vhs you go to noman you start doing the career you're going at a gentle giant and you realize and you get into characters you do your three or your 13, 13. characters oh, sculpts, and yeah. from there at some point somewhere along the way you're using a lot of different softwares and then within that you find z modeler how does how does that all kind of oh, come together good tie-in chris that was beautiful i like that <laughs> um, this is okay. just gonna be you i'm supposed to be complimenting you right now no it's beautiful i love that i was like oh oh wow i'm supposed to talk about that yeah he, he did a good job yeah wow yeah, okay so, so that is the title of the stream by the way that's right that's what we're going to talk about not not anime okay cool cool <laughs> Um, okay, so I guess it all started. Um, I, I took the first hard surface ZBrush class at Noman, uh, and it wasn't called Z Modeler. I don't even think Z Modeler was in the title, but it was taught by Paul Gabry. And if you know Paul Gabry, if you use ZBrush, you know Paul Gabry. But it's essentially his job to know everything about ZBrush. I think his job is actually to go to studios and show them how awesome it is, and then they buy it. Like, you know, like buy licenses, know, something like that. Um, yeah. But I had a really hard time with that class, like I did all the other classes. <laughs> um, and I squeaked something out or whatever. Um, but then, like, I had that right in the back of my mind, and I slowly kind of added it into my workflow. And now that I'm really proficient with it, I remember what it was like to not be able to use it. And it changed the game so much for me that I think that's why I pushed into teaching it more than anything else. Like, when no one was like, what do you want to teach? I said, oh, I got it. Well, two things. Stylized characters and a Z modeler. Stylized character and Z modeler, which uh, you also have on Nomen Workshop. But before we get into all oh, that. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> before we get into all that, why are you here? You're here to show us some some cool stuff in, in sculpting and Z modeler. That's right. So I'm here to promote my course, uh, Sculpting and Z modeler. And so I'm going to do a little demo and, and talk about kind of how to use Z modeler and how I specifically use Z modeler and all that stuff. Yeah, so why don't we uh, get into it? And, and for everyone watching, um, go ahead and drop a question. We're going to ask a couple more questions to Daniel at the end. Uh, any kind of questions, you know, as long as they're uh, reasonable and respectful. And uh, Daniel, take it away. I'm excited. I'm actually very excited to see this. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let me pull up ZBrush. And you tell me if you could see this, and I'll wait to start then. Uh, yeah, we can see it. We're good to go? OK. Looks great, yeah. OK, so like I said, um, we're going to be learning about Z Modeler. I'm going to go over the absolute basics. I'm going to break it down so it's not as confusing as when I first learned it, right? Because I, I had such a hard time learning Z Modeler that I kind of understand what it's like to look at this very complex brush um, and break it down. After that, I'm going to go into what in ZBrush I use in combination with Z Modeler to do what I do with it, right? Sculpting with Z Modeler. Um, and then after that, I'll go into a small demo where I kind of um, put it into practice and kind of show you something that I would actually do while I was working, while I'm working on a character. So the first thing we need to do 
is I'm going to initialize this star into a cube. And that'll give me just some like a basic thing to work on, essentially. This part's going to be a little boring, I'm not going to lie. I'm not really going to be making anything right now. But this is perfect to kind of showcase how the brush works. So when you're using Zmodeler, the first thing you want to do is make sure that polyframe is on. If you can't see the edge loops, if you can't see the verts, and if you can't see the poly groups, um, then you're blind. You're kind of going in blind. And like I'll explain later, uh, poly groups are really important when you're using Zmodeler. So you can go up to brush and click Zmodeler, or you could do B, Z, M, and it'll select it for you. If you're watching this and you've never used Zmodeler, but you are a 3D artist, then you probably have a package that you model in, right? So whether that's Maya or 3ds Max or Blender. Me, it was Maya. So I, before I learned Zmodeler, I used um, Maya to model. Sorry. Um, and so if you can imagine, all the tools <clears throat> that you use to model in Maya are put into this one brush in Zmodeler. So when you're modeling, on an object, there are three things you can affect, right? There's the verts, there's the edges, and there's the faces. So even though all this is in one brush, there, Pixelogic needed a way to kind of break these three things up so that it wasn't all together and confusing. But when you first pick up this brush, it looks super confusing. Because any other brush, you could just grab it and start using it. But this, it's there's red, there's white, there's all these words coming up everywhere. The words change the minute you move your mouse. But I promise you, it's actually really well designed, and it's pretty straightforward if you can figure it out. OK, so how this works is when you're hovering over a face, edge, or vert, that means that you have the ability to edit it. And so when you're on a face, or vert, or edge, you press spacebar. And if you're holding spacebar, you get to see these two option boxes, right? One of them is actions, and one of them is target. And then some of them have you know, extra boxes, depending on what the, um, the tool is or the action. Now, actions is what you're doing, right? So are you deleting a polygon? And then the target is, what am I doing it to? So are you deleting a single poly? Are you deleting a poly loop? Are you deleting a flat island? Uh, what are you doing? And so essentially, all of these tools are like this, right? Uh, the edge loop is the same way, and the verts are the same way, too. So the reason why this is confusing, and I probably don't even have to mention it, but there's like 40 different options here. So it can be extremely confusing. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go through face, edge, and vert, and we're going to talk about which ones are used the most, and then the rest you can kind of forget. Not that they're useless, but because, like for example, right now you don't need poly group front facing only, right? Like that's such a specific thing where really you could just do poly group flat island or poly group single poly, right? Um, and so, yeah, so what we're going to do now is we're going to forget about those other ones and we're just going to go through the basics. So let's go through the poly groups first, or the uh, faces. We're going to do single poly the whole time, but if I feel like it's necessary, I'll go into a bigger target. So the first one is delete. And so again, if I do delete poly group, it's going to delete the whole poly group. If I do poly loop, then it's going to do the whole poly loop. Next one is extrude. If I do extrude one poly group or poly, it'll do that. And then if we do inset, that's another good one. And then if you understand normals and how they can be flipped sometimes, we can use flip faces. OK, so that's about it, really. I mean, if we're looking through this, I think move is another good one to use. Um, and then, yeah, that's about it. So as you can see, there's like 20 or 30 different options here. And we really only need to use four or five to get the basics down. And let's go ahead and go into edges. So. Let's go from left to right, bevel. So everyone knows bevel, right? This is a very common tool. And then, of course, you can bevel partial. And then we're going to jump over to bridge. So if you pick two edges, it'll close it. And then close, which you pick one edge and it closes, closes it. This is much better used 
um, if you have a big opening and a lot of edges and it'll close it all together. But, so here it's kind of hard to show it, but that's what it does. Okay, so we did insert, we did delete. Uh, crease is another interesting one. Maya has this too and other modeling programs do. Uh, but if you press crease and then we press D, which is uh, dynamic subdiv, it's essentially saying this is what it'll look like when it's smooth, right? Um, and if you crease an edge, it's pretending that there's holding edges there. And then when you subdivide, um, ZBrush will make sure that the holding edges are there to hold that edge. If I increase, it'll do this. And then, like for example, we can get that edge to kind of look like that if we add the edge loops there. Right? Sharp. Okay. And then slide. Slide is a really big one, right? So you can slide just an edge, or you can slide an entire edge loop. And here's the thing. If you're using ZModeler, right, um, and you're just using the basics, you're going to be stuck just extruding a cube and making very simple things. And so you need to learn all these extra tools to kind of make things interesting. If you're in a studio and you're asked to make a prop or something, they're going to say, OK, we have this. Let's say this is an engine or something. And they're going to say, we want something sticking out of the side here. So you need to learn how to edit the topology in a way that you can put things where they want them to be and then also come in here later and make the topology even and clean. So that's a really important tool, sliding edges around to be able to move the topology in a way where you can get the shapes that you need. OK, and then I think that's it. Insert, bevel, bridge, close, crease, delete. A lot of these share the same tools, but you can ignore the rest for now. And then as you get better, you can go, oh, like let me see what spin does. Let me do what switch does. Uh, let me see what swivel does. But for now, you don't really need it. OK, and then the last one is going to be verts. So delete, we know that. Um, there we go. Move, which I don't use as much because we do have slide just like we do with the edge loops. And that's also super important too. And then stitch is another one. So if we stitch, you can do stitch to the other verts. So if I click two verts, the last one is the one it'll go to. Or you can do stitch to middle. So I'll do that now, stitch. And so as you see, it went to end. And that's on that third option there. If I do to midpoint, it'll go together instead of at the end. And then last one, and we'll be all through the basics. This is it. Like This is what you need to know to model in ZModeler, at least the basics. The last one is split. So what's cool about this is if you have four clean faces on your model, if you split the center point, you will get a perfect circle. Specifically, if I press uh, D, then I'm accepted. And what's even nicer about this is it has a crease all the way around. If I go to crease, uncrease all, you'll see that it kind of collapses back into a square. But because it does this, if I subdivide up, it'll make sure that that, um, that sphere stays circular. OK, so you have an interesting cube. You know how to extrude faces from a cube. Um, but how do you actually make something interesting? How do I take ZModeler and use it in a way where I start with a cube like this, but I end up with a character that's ready for animation, right? Or how do I end up with a prop that has shape design and all these other things? Well, we have to use ZBrush in conjunction with ZModeler. They're the same program, but that's the way I was able to kind of break it down, right? Um, so the three things are masking, polygrouping, uh, and getting really good with the gizmo tool, which is this. So let's go ahead and talk about grouping first. We've kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, but the big aha moment I had when I was learning ZModeler was that you need to isolate what you want to work on, right? You have this single object. It's one subtool, right? And in order to work on specific parts, you want to isolate them. So for example, I'll use select rec, and I'll change it to lasso. And if you press Control Shift, these are like ZBrush basics, um, but I'll go ahead and try to explain as much as I can as I go. Uh, but if I press Control Shift, I can isolate, okay? and then uh, Control Shift Alt kind of hide stuff. If I press Control W, it'll give it its own polygroup. And like we had mentioned, um, in the target, ZModeler has specific actions to address only polygroups. 
So I know this seems simple and whatever, but this is like, this is it. This is the key. Like if you're a beginner in Z model and you're like, how do I do complicated things? This is kind of it. And the reason why is like I said, you're isolating parts of the object so you can work on them. And so let me talk about other ways I isolate the object too while we're using Z modeler. So the other one is masking. Uh, if I mask this, right, and invert the selection, so this is the part I wanna work on, and I insert a vertices, you'll see, oh, sorry, insert an edge loop, you'll see that Z modeler respects the mask, right? It's not gonna do anything past the mask. And that's one way to do that. And now a more complex way that I do is I actually separate my model into multiple shells, um, but same subtool so that I can work on that shell by itself. And then when I'm ready, I can merge it all back together. So I, I don't know if how far you guys are all like with modeling, but when I first started modeling, if I needed to add a small detail, I would start adding edge loops where I needed them, right? Because you need more topology to make that shape. But then at the end of it, you have these edge loops running all over your model. And then you have to go in and clean it and figure it all out. So for example here, this is kind of a perfect way to do this. I inset the model, right? This um, part that I'm working on. And if I delete this here, there, I have this isolated shelf here. It's also a poly group. But now whenever I add an edge loop here, you see that it doesn't go off into the rest of the model. So I can do whatever I want here. I can add gadgets and bumps and whatever whatever detail is in the model and then when i'm done i say okay this looks good i'll go back and say okay i have two faces here i have three on this side i need to make sure that this side now has the matching uh sides so that i can bridge them together right like that for example okay so now we know that in order to use z modeler you need the basics but you also need to learn how to isolate parts of the model so that you can work on things individually and then kind of put them back in later. This is like, I guess a good example would be if I'm modeling a face, which I think most people would do the basic pipeline, right? Is you sculpt a face, you bring it into Maya or uh, 3ds Max or whatever program you use. And then you would use like Topo Gun or um, QMesh to kind of, uh, not QMesh, um, I forgot the name, but essentially you would re-topologize your character and create new topology. But here what I'm doing is creating proper topology right off the bat and making design changes with good topology. So for example, I will model a face that's like animation ready from a cube or from like, you know, a zero mesh sphere or something. And if I'm working on the nose, I'll make sure that there's an edge loop around the nose and I cut that edge loop out. And then I could like, when it's, even though it's the same sub tool, I can edit that nose and work on it. And then when I'm done, I can bring it all back together. So like, the mouth, right? Everything has a, an edge loop around the mouth, edge loop around the nose, the eyes have an edge loop, and I'm able to kind of edit that separately. So hopefully that makes more sense than this uh, abstract shape that I've made, but that's a, kind of an example of how I would use it. Now, the pipeline, I guess, if, how I would break it up, um, well, well, how I work is I model the basic shape of what I'm making, fire hydrant, hammer, uh, hand, cloth, whatever it is. And then I use masking, polygrouping, and the gizmo tool to rotate it into the basic shape that I want, right? So we have the basic, basic shape, and then I start rotating things and moving it and turning it so that it has good shape. And then that's when I bring out the, the move brush, uh, the damn standard to give it that nice shape language that stylized models and characters have. So we're gonna do a little example here just so I can show you. So if I wanted to take this and bring it up and rotate it, right, I would mask this out, invert it, and I would press W, and that would give me the gizmo tool, right? And when I say you want to master the gizmo tool, um, you want to master being able to put it exactly where you want it because the gizmo tool is going to be the pivot for where you're turning the model or that part of the model and where you want it to be. So how do you put the gizmo tool where you want it? Um, you press Alt. And if I press Alt over the white part or over um, the transpose arrows, you'll see that this is unlocking, or you can unlock it yourself, right? And then it'll stay unlocked. So you need to put it in the place where you want to rotate it by pressing Alt. Right? I'm holding Alt, and then I'm moving with the transpose tool or grabbing um, the white edges. And then I can start rotating into place. 
And so like on my Lantern robot, this is how I made the fingers, which I guess is a really simple example. Um, but I had just a long rectangle with a bunch of edge loops in it. And then I would, you know, mask the tip, move the gizmo tool into place, rotate, mask the next section, move the gizmo tool, rotate into place. And that's essentially it. Um, but a couple tips with the gizmo tool, just so you're not, um, just that helped me out a lot. Um, if you press Alt and you click on a vert, it'll snap to that vert. Now, even more so, if you click Alt, click on the vert, and then rotate around, hopefully you can see this, but it essentially snaps to near my verts too. Uh, when I was first working in Z Modeler, the feeling that I had, because all I had to compare it to was uh, box modeling, was that it felt loose, like it, it wasn't grounded kind of like Maya is. And the way to get that grounded feeling is to use the gizmo tool, right? And essentially have all the angles that you want. So if I'm rotating something, I'm rotating it properly at the 90 degree angle, right? So if I, if I want to work on this side, I make sure that the gizmo is right on there and it's facing correctly. Um, so that's another thing too. If you, if you click on something here, right? Let's say this. And it, Sometimes the gizmo will get messed up like this. If you uh, unlock this and then press reset orientation, it'll make sure it's perfectly lined up with the X, Y, and Z axis. OK, so let's say this was the shape that we wanted. We modeled our cube, the basic shape. We rotated it into place. Um, and then what we would do is now we're going to bring out like the move brush and uh, the damn standard to kind of give it that actual shape language that um, will make it look finished. This is all abstract, and I will go into an actual demonstration soon. Um, but yeah, so I gave it, I'm giving it a little bit extra topology just so I can I have something to push around. And then I usually work in um, sub D, right? Uh, dynamic subdivisions. So let me grab the move brush. And this is the part that it's, I guess it's a little deceiving, but it's, it's sculpting with Z modeler, right? But what I'm really doing is I'm moving verts around in dynamic subdiv. Um, and I can actually grab these little dots that are representing where the vertices is before it collapses in on itself. And to be completely honest, I don't even use, um, I don't use a drawing tablet when I'm doing this kind of stuff. I can use, you, you, um, use a mouse. I don't even need to have a Cintiq or anything like that. Um, and the reason why is because no matter what I do, I have such few vertices to work with here that I know that I can't really mess up this model, right? Let me delete this weird face that's underneath here. Let's see how fast I am? OK. <laughs> um, OK. So the reason why I'm able to do this and I don't have to use a pen or anything like that is because there's so few vertices. If I took this and I subdivided it a bunch, right? Turn off dynamic subdiv. And let's say I decided to push this around um, and make edits to it, right? Okay. And so essentially, okay, this is the basic shape that I want, whatever. Uh, and then I tried to go back in later with like a flat brush or something else and try to get it to look clean. I would never get it back to that original shape. It would be impossible because there's just way too much topology going on. Sometimes people ask me, well, you know, how do you keep the model so clean? And this is how, essentially, is because I'm working in dynamic subdiv. I'm obviously checking, too, to make sure that I don't have, um, that I'm not going too crazy. And then if I don't have enough topology, but the shape looks good, then I'll go ahead and divide it once, and then I'll work from that shape. OK, so now we went through the entire process, right? Um, we went through the basics of ZModeler. We talked about how I use other parts of ZBrush to get ZModeler to work the way I wanted to write sculpting with ZModeler. And now I'm going to go over a small demonstration where I actually show you how I use it like on a day-to-day -day basis. Because this, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure what this is. It's just ridiculous. Okay. So I have this arm here which I posed using all the messes I talked about. I polygrouped the hands so I could isolate them, right? Use the gizmo to place where I want that to be, and then I can rotate things into place. It's pretty simple, but if you combine this, like masking, polygrouping, rotating, isolating, all with Z model, you could do anything. 
And the beauty of Zmodeler is that it has the structure of Maya when it comes to its modeling, but it has the flow that ZBrush has. And so it, I mean, I don't, I know, I don't know a lot of people. It's, it's kind of a weird mix right now. And I think that's why I like to talk about it so much is because I meet people who have never used it. And when I say, oh, you know, I like to use Zmodeler, do you, like if I'm at a studio, I'll say, do you mind if I use Zmodeler to model instead of box model? And they're like, oh no, Zmodeler is too messy and whatever. I'm like, oh, maybe you haven't taken my class or something. <laughs> just kidding. But yeah, so uh, it's, it's an interesting thing where I don't think, I think there are people using it, but I think not everyone understands how powerful it can be. Um, so yeah, so <clears throat> what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna bring in a sphere and I'm essentially gonna create uh, a sleeve and we're gonna go over, um, we're going to put in a wrinkle and I'm going to show you how to do that with correct topology. We're not going to sculpt it and then retop over it or anything like that. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to turn this into a sphere. Now, <clears throat> normally what you would do is if you, if you were creating an animated character, you would just like, and you wanted to make a sleeve, you would duplicate, duplicate the arm and then just like cut off the hand and then use that topology as the base mesh for your sleeve because whenever you're rigging you want the clothing to have a very similar placement to the body topology underneath so that you can share the weight paint of the topology but what we're going to do here is start from a sphere because i want to talk about zero mesh a little bit um i don't model things everything from directly a cube sometimes i do push around topology and dynamesh and i get a lot of stuff going on and so I need to zero mesh to get myself clean topology. So then I can start Z um, using Z model on it. So let's divide this up a bunch. We'll do that probably. Yeah. I'm also looking up here, by the way, this tells me how much, how many polygons there are. Okay. And now I'm just going to use the move tool again, all with a mouse. Because even this doesn't have this much topology, so I'm able to kind of move it around, no big deal. And this is a, a very simple example, but I thought this would be a good thing to do where I'm not noodling on it for hours, but it also kind of explains uh, my pipeline and how I do things without kind of leaving anything out really, hopefully. Okay. So we have our basic sleeve. I don't want to get too into it. Um, but yeah, do you see this topology? You cannot use Z modeler on this topology. There's not a single part of this that would work. But let's talk about zero mesh because it's really important to get zero mesh to work properly. And zero mesh is a button you press and it gives you good topology, or at least I think that's how a lot of other people see it. Um, but really it's, it's kind of, it's not that smart and you need to guide it. And there's a couple things that you can do to make your zero mesh work better. So one of them uh, is turning on mirroring. If you have symmetry on, it's going to obey the symmetry and it's going to create both sides evenly, which will really help. Two is to have open caps. So if I zero mesh this right now, let's do half. If I do this, there's going to be edge loops everywhere. It's going to look kind of clean, but you're going to end up with edge loops that go all over the place. It's going to be crazy. Okay, let's see if I can delete an edge loop and hopefully something weird will happen. So it proves my point. Yep, that would be a good example. So do you see how it says I can't delete every single polygon? That's because if I do this, it'll delete everything because it's looping around in all kinds of crazy ways. It looks really clean, but there's a lot more going on than you think. So. The way to make the topology clean or to help Z modeler is to cut off the caps is what they're called. Usually if you have a, like a cylinder, it's the top part and the bottom, the parts that close off the mesh. If you don't have closed off edges, then your topology can only go from start to finish. It will not loop around and that'll give you clean topology. So the way we'll do that is press control shift and then we'll pick slice curve. And then if you do control shift drag, uh, this will essentially create a polygroup above this, wherever the dark shadow is, um, is where the polygroup is going to be facing. And then we'll do it here too. 
And then we're going to use Zmodeler for this. You don't really have to. Um, but I would isolate this, do Control Shift with uh, Select Rect, do Control W to give these guys their own group, and then we would delete this polygroup. OK, so mirroring, which we're not using because it's a sleeve. Yes, we could, but it's not necessary. Um, having open ends, <clears throat> and then having clean edges. Now, topologically, this edge is gross. It's not good. But physically speaking, it's very straight. So now if we zero mesh, we should get something pretty clean. Cool. See? So if I went ahead and deleted a poly loop, it should just delete the one poly loop. Where before it was like, it was probably running so far around the model that it was like, if you delete a poly loop, it'll there won't be anything left over. Okay, so I'll do this one more time. Okay, so this is decent topology. It's pretty low. And so now we're going to use all the things we kind of mentioned to uh, model in a sleeve. So what do we do, right? I want to put the wrinkle right about here. <clears throat> and so let's start deleting some of these faces and create essentially an island just on both sides so that I can work on the actual fold and not worry about it affecting the rest of the sleeve. And this is a good time to talk about kind of a more interesting tool, the QMesh that I think I had mentioned. Um, no matter what uh, action or target you have, if you press Alt and glide across uh, the faces, it'll give you what looks like a polygroup. Uh, but it's actually a, uh, it's a pseudo polygroup. If you deleted polygroup all, it would still consider um, itself as part of this green group. So what I need to do is isolate the green, in invert, and then give it its own polygroup, and then I can delete. Great, OK. And then now I'm going to mask off this wrinkle, and then I'm going to start moving into place, like I had mentioned. And then let's turn on double so I can see to the other side. This is just one way to do this. But this the idea behind this is, yes, it's just one wrinkle. Yes, it's just a sleeve. Um, but <clears throat> the idea is that you want to be able to do this to anything, right? It's any basic shape, right? Take kind of gross topology, make it good enough to use Zmodeler on it, and then learn how to be able to adjust the path of the topology, but also still have clean topology. So that's what we're going to do now, is I'm going to kind of mess up the topology, and then we're going to reroute the topology so that it's still good. So I masked off the wrinkle. And then if I press Control click, it'll invert it. Let's move our gizmo tool here. And now we're going to rotate this. Looks kind of weird, but we'll fix it with the move tool, right? Because there's not that much topology, so no big deal. Okay. Right, if I had a million polygons, I would never be able to keep something clean like this. And this is just a demo. I would have spent a lot more time making sure that things are nice and clean or whatever. OK. <clears throat> so if you know anything about topology, you would know that those beautiful quads we had that Zero Mesh gave us are now gone. We have these kind of tight areas here and here. So what we need to do is add an edge loop here. And here. Okay. And now I'm going to talk about a little bit about kiting and redirecting topology. So if you want to use Zmodeler, but you don't know how to box model, if you want to, sorry, if you want to use Zmodeler the way I use Zmodeler um, to make proper animation topology, you need to know how to retopologize because you need to understand flow of topology and how that works, right? Um, so one method of changing the flow of topology is to kite things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete these two faces. And then I'm going to stitch these two points right in the middle.
All right, everyone. Uh, seems like we're having a little bit of technical issue here. <clears throat> Not sure we can hear you, uh, Daniel, but if you get a second, go ahead and adjust that wondrous mic of yours. And while we work on that, now is a good time as any to let you all know that Daniel did mention his lantern robot while he was doing this. We were going to talk about it later, but he he went and he 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 blew the secret. I'm just joking. <laughs> but if you're interested in any of Daniel's classes on Noman Workshop right now, we are offering uh, or or Noman Workshop is offering a discount. Uh, D Zenny twenty, and it expires February fifteenth. So. I'm sure a lot of you watching right now haven't gotten your loved one a Valentine's Day gift. This is it. This is it right here. This is the calling for you to get them that Valentine's Day gift. I mean, it's discounted. It's the, it's the way to go. And if you haven't checked out Daniel Zenny's Noman Workshop uh, workshops, he actually has two that are remarkable uh, and, and they're very insightful. I mean, even though the audio is not here. I have to say, one of the great things about watching Daniel, watching him go through all of this right now, is every time I see somebody doing something like this, and Z-Model or anything like that, they always are just like, yeah, I mean, he was he was talking earlier, and he goes, oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay, sure, Daniel, that's it. I mean, it's some of the most impressive stuff that I've ever seen, and every time I see it, it always blows me away. But everybody that knows how to do that stuff, they're just like, oh, yeah, it's so simple, and there it is. Those, those are all the basics. And I'm like, holy smokes, that looks amazing. It's so, To me, it's always so impressive. And so if you're ever curious about how to kind of get into that stuff um, or just want to dabble in it a little bit, again, I do urge you to check out Noman Workshop and use that discount code, dzany 20 it's definitely a good time to to do it. And we are going to take a little bit of a break, try and figure out this uh, technical issue and come back with this sleeve. Thanks for staying with us. We'll see you all soon. Okay, I think I'm good. Okay. Sorry about that. I just tried to plug in, and I just tried to plug in my mic, and it stopped working. Okay. So, really quick, I had these faces uh, cut off, right? Same thing here. I kited the topology, and I made sure that I had the same amount of edges on both sides so that I can bridge them back together. Um, and the reason why you want to do that is, A, because I have detail going on here, but on the back, I want to keep it clean. And in animation, this topology is based off the topology underneath, like I had mentioned, and so we want to make sure it stays clean. And then we'll go in with Move Brush and just clean things up a little bit. Okay, so now I have the topology in place. I can start using uh, the damn standard brush. I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, to start sculpting in this wrinkle. So what you can see here is that I'm still using the mouse, but because there's only there's only so many verts, I can actually run across the verts and they will kind of pop up one at a time, which is really nice. And everything stays really clean.
Now, that being said, you would have multiple folds. There would be a lot more like art direction in this scenario. Um, but this is essentially how I create direct, directly animation ready topology without having to um, use ready topology or anything like that. Uh, and then like what we can do now that we have this sleeve in here um, is I can add kind of like a cap to this. So I'll do, go ahead and do close convex hole. And let me hide the hand for a second. When you do close and you drag, it'll give you edge loops if you want them. So I just want one because I want to add like a cuff to the sleeve. I'll isolate the sleeve, invert, and then control W on that. So that it has its own instead of that kind of like wild circus topology. And then I'll do extrude poly loop. And then when you're doing anything with a poly loop, you want to kind of look at what direction it's going in. If you could see here that the yellow arrow is kind of pointing it, do I want this one? Do I want this one, which obviously I don't, or do I want uh, this? Let me zoom out a bit. OK, so now I have this basic cuff, and I can use, again, um, move brush to kind of move things into place. Without worrying too much, right? Because I know that there's not a lot of topology. And then let's go ahead and add some holding edges here. And then right at the edge here, I want this to be rounded, so I'll actually just bevel it. Bevel complete. And then we'll slide around the edges a little bit so we get exactly what we want. OK, and that's it. So I was able to create this sleeve that has detail in it um, while maintaining the proper topology. Um, so the basics here are, right, like, well, I'll just go over it one more time. You model the basic shape of what you want. So in this case, it was just a tube because it was a sleeve. Um, we cut off the caps so to make sure that we could use zero mesh properly. We got the proper nice topology. We then cut out an area around where we wanted to work, right, kind of like a construction zone, so it wouldn't affect the topology around it. We moved the topology how we needed it to be within that construction zone. Uh, we made our edits, and then we made sure that everything would bridge back together properly once we knew that whatever was inside that detailed area was what we wanted. Um, and then we, since we had the proper topology there and we had the model, then we brought up the move brush, the damn standard, and we used that to create the nice detail that you get in the shape language that you would see in um, a finished product. And there you go. So that was amazing. Thank you so much for that, Daniel. Let's uh, let's come back in here. I know you'd said to, to ask you the questions while you were going through everything, but you were on such a roll. I was <laughs> letting the questions roll in. I mean, you really that was that was very uh, concise. Um, I I'd said it on the break a little bit before we you know uh, while we were having that, but I, again, right, sorry about that. This is, yeah, it's okay. Uh, but I, I, I have to say this. Every time I see this stuff, my favorite part is, um, you know, anybody uh, that works on all this, just like how you were doing. After you're done, you're always like, that's it. It's all done. It's that that's simple. It. It's, it's like, sure. Safe. For sure, yeah. But I think that looks amazing. I mean, it's so clean, right? Um, Thank you. If you told me that it took you, you know, four hours and slaving to do it, I'd be like, yeah, it looks like it took four hours. <laughs> oh, th difficult. Thanks, that Chris. It's very nice looking, of you. <laughs> you know? um, OK, so we have some questions. And if you don't mind, uh, I'd love to uh, get your answer on some yeah. of these coming in Hit from the chat. Them. So uh, somebody was just kind of asking a general idea of, of how difficult ZBrush is to pick up and do you need a sculpting background? Now, you can actually speak on this because oh, yeah. like you said, when you came into Noman, you didn't even really have any of that. So 
why don't you tell us a little bit about your ZBrush journey and, and how difficult it was without that sculpting background and stuff? That's a really good question. Um, I took one traditional modeling class at um, at Noman, um, and I had never sculpted before. I think I, I think I had maybe done something like when I was ten. You know, like I had never even thought that sculpting or three D was anything I would ever do. Um, but then I got into ZBrush, and it's totally different. I don't know how to explain. Yes, it would be. It's it's good to have good shape language and understanding of shapes and design. And I kind of already had that because I. I drew and I would do gesture drawings, right? I practiced, I studied a little bit of anatomy. Uh, but the hardest thing about ZBrush, and I have to say this, and I'm sure everyone would agree, is the interface it is crazy. It's it's just like all over the place. There's all kinds of different buttons. But once you get used to it, you, you, that's the hardest part. Let's just say that. The hardest part about ZBrush is learning the interface. After that, it's it's awesome. Okay, so then that actually doesn't seem too difficult because it's, it's like any other program, right? Like you, you totally. have to know where everything's at and then, but um, you, you say shape language. So what exactly do you mean when you say that? Like just overall shapes and what, what things are, like what shapes things are comprised of? Uh, so it's essentially just design, design language, right? It's uh, straights versus curves and uh, that kind of stuff. Um, also just like anatomy and gesture so things don't look stiff. It's that kind of stuff where if you can do it in a drawing, you could, you'll probably be able to transfer it over in 3D. The only difficult part is, right, you have multiple angles that you're looking at now. So, you know, you're, a lot of times students will focus in really hard on one side and then they'll rotate it around and it's like flat. And you're like, ah, oh, crap. So I think that's <laughs> kind of, <laughs> that's, that's the difficult part. Yeah, I definitely run into that just with my 2D drawings. I think that they look good. And then I'm like, let me flip it and it'll look fine. And right. I flip it and I'm like, oh, that looks disgusting. <laughs> totally. That's 3D, but like every angle. So yeah. <laughs> so then uh, another question that came in is how do you deal with the lack of snapping in ZBrush that other 3D packages have when Z modeling? You're talking about like snapping verts together? Sure. Uh, you can actually you can actually uh, snap verts together. In but you are totally right. When I'm working in animation, a lot of times you want... So go a little bit into it, but when you're rigging something, you want verts to be as close to where they are to each other as possible. So for example, if a character, like I said, right, normally in animation, you would have the sleeve and the sleeve would be made up of the topology underneath it because in a rig, there are joints and the joints control the topology, right? Um, and the weight on the vert tells the joint how much that polygon moves whenever that joint moves so if i have a sleeve and it's on top of the arm i want that sleeve to move exactly as much as the arm does so the, the topology if the verts are right on top of each other i can just just like photoshop you can copy and paste so you can say i want okay this vert has 60 percent weight on it i want the shirt that's the vert of the shirt that's right on top i want that to have the same exact weight too uh, so that is something that is a bit difficult but i'm pretty sure you can snap verts together um in Z, Z modeler anyway, but you're right. I mean, I do even, even if I take it 99% and then bring it to Z modeler and then do my snapping there, like, you know, it's, it's such a powerful tool. Okay. So let's, let's back up just a little bit. For, for those <laughs> so who, much. I'm sure. For those who don't know, no, it's totally fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's take care of a little bit of some of these other questions as a whole, right? Oh. So rigging as oh, a geez, whole, yeah. um, why don't you explain a little bit of, of what that is? Because you can't just model something and then bring it oh. into an animated feature, right? That's not how no. it works. Yeah. Um, so there is there is the rigging aspect. And so rigging as a whole, why don't you just like a like an elevator pitch for, for sure. anybody okay. in the chat that might not understand what that is. I'm not so, speaking for myself. <laughs> totally, yeah. Um, so you could, you know, I will take like a finger and I'll rotate it into place and all that stuff. Like I'll, I'll mask something off and I'll rotate it like I did in ZBrush. Um, you could technically do that and animate a, a character, but it would take you five years just to get like a hand raised, right? <laughs> okay. okay. So a rig is our bones that are put inside of the model. And then the rigger essentially makes 
a game character that the animator can use. So when you open up a nice rig, it's going to be like, here are the face controls. If you slide this over, the eyelid will go up. If you slide this, the mouth will open. And there's blend shapes involved and all this other stuff. But essentially, it's, it's a puppet, right? It's the actual puppet, like those strings and the wires and stuff. And so then when you were talking about the sleeve, you're saying that you're rigging the actual arm, not the sleeve, but then the response of the sleeve to the rig arm essentially right right so you you want the sleeve to follow the arm perfectly and the best way to do that is for them to have similar points mm -hmm. if 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 you know like for example like you have an edge loop here on the arm and then like right here that next edge loop is over here on the shirt when they go up you're going to note it's going to kind of do this where they're going to start colliding into each other or being weird so if they're exactly with each other then they'll move together yeah, we, we're gonna we're gonna cross over from uh, a, a simple basic question to an, okay. a nice more advanced question. At least I think so. Uh, is it better to work with dynamic subdiv rather than subdividing? When do you apply the dynamic subdiv? So before we get into the answer, okay, give us a little bit about a, a subdiv and subdividing. Uh, so going way back. Um, in 3D history, because I think you kind you kind of need to understand that to like know why it exists. Like why why do we have smooth mesh preview? Yeah, go for it. And the reason why is because now so okay so now you could take a three million polygon di di uh, whatever tree, put it into a game, and the engine won't even like notice it. It'll be like, Meh, who cares? Not really, but pretty like nano mesh for example is a good yeah. example of something where it's like. Oh, nanite, sorry, nanite, where it's like you can literally put millions of polygons into Unreal and it doesn't, it's like, eh, that's nothing. But back in the day, the computers could not handle that much topology. So what they did was essentially saying that you could have um, like a sphere that only has a couple verts, but what it does is the verts will look at each other, the distance between each other, and they will kind of rely on each other and they'll collapse. So you're able to see what would this look like if I divide it up. It's like... Um, it's like a fake subdivision so that you're looking at something that looks smooth, but actually, realistically, there's not that much topology there. And that's how they were able to avoid eating too much of the memory of the computers at the time. And they still do that for animation, obviously, but I'm just saying that's that's kind of where it comes from. Mm, OK, so then um, is it better to work with the dynamic sub uh, subdiv rather than subdividing or when do you apply? The dynamic subdiv. So we have the history. Now we go yeah. back to the question. Uh, so, so when I was going to school, they always told us not to work in smooth mesh preview because you can push something too far where it looks fine in dynamic subdiv, but then when you undo it, you have a vert that's like all the way in left field because it's smoothing back into place. So I would say I use it all the time. I am constantly working with, but I'm also aware that I need to jump back and forth and make sure that I didn't yank something to left field. So if you're new, maybe don't use so much. But I do say that you should, it, I prefer using it than actually dividing up because you're working with less topology. Um, it's easier to move around. But if you do subdivide up, you can always recreate those lower subdivisions if you lose them as long as the mesh is still made up of quads and all that. So it's really up to you, I guess. So it's, it is kind of like flipping a flipping a 2D image. You just kind of have to pay attention to what you're doing as you're doing right. it. And, yeah. and that, that totally makes sense to tell students that because I could totally see being like, hey, model this couch. And then you send them home and they come back. It looks beautiful when I press three. I press one and it's like, whack. And there's like all these birds. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I just had the visual of that. Just, just absolutely explained. exploding, yeah. It's like an explosion, yeah. A Michael Bay couch. Um, exactly. On phases equally sized when using Z modeler. One more time, I lost you for a second. How do you keep the polygon faces equally sized when using Z modeler? Well, that's a good question. Well, the thing is that you have that much control when you're using Z modeler. So, but well, I think I see what you're saying. How do you keep the mesh quadded? And the idea is that you start with a nice mesh that has the the like has so when you're working on a model you, like you know you're looking at a grid and I, if, if i took a plane and i divided it the squares would get smaller and smaller and smaller right because there's more and more squares so when you're working on an object you kind of need to think before and how much topology will i need to edit this so if i look at a sphere and i'm okay i want to add eyes i want to add nose i want to add mouth i look at those different parts and say is there enough topology here for me to like cut those things out and start modeling them um so it really depends on what you're working on 
Um, but you usually start with decent topology, right? Like you get it to that place where, okay, this basic shape has a nice, smooth, even topology, nice quads, and then you go in at it. And then like kind of like you saw that where I bridged it back and some of the parts were a little wonky, you would just like mm -hmm. slide them back into place and make them look nice. Fine. It would go through the, a tech pass, essentially. I guess that would be the sculpting aspect. And then, oh, that one just disappeared. Do you also uh, UV inside of ZBrush since your model is nice and low poly? So just real quick, UV doesn't stand for ultraviolet. Uh, <laughs> if you want to, you want to just uh, touch on that a little bit, and then and then uh, I can re-ask the question as well. Sure. Uh, so UVs, the best way that they actually explain this to you at Nomen too, is that you know those chocolate Santas you buy at the store. Uh huh. I don't know why you'd buy one, but you'd like Christmas that it's the yeah, outside they got the has rabbits too. Yes. So the, the wrapper has the picture on it. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you take it off, the inside is just like chocolate, mm -hmm. but it's still the same shapes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So if you took that and unwrapped it, you would see that same Santa image, but it's like flattened out. So his arms would be here. His hat would be like up here and everything's kind of like laid out. I guess yeah. taxidermy might be another example where you like cut it and you, or uh, sorry, bear rug. Chocolate bear rug, Santa's to taxidermy. Welcome to the Very Nomen live stream, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you're essentially, you're cutting up the model, unfolding it, and you're painting on that. Now you can, there are programs where you can paint directly like, ZBrush or Substance Painter, but at the end of the day, you need that UV map so you can, which will become your texture map, and you export that and you can apply it on the model. Okay, so then, uh, do you also use UV inside a ZBrush since your model is nice and low poly? Um, you can you can definitely UV in ZBrush, no problem. But uh, I have to say, Maya does have really good. Uh, UV set, UV layout, and all this other stuff. I mean, it's just technically it's a better, but I do, I do. Like for personal projects, no problem. You polygroup it, um, plug in UV, uh, split by polygroups, turn on symmetry. Like you can get some nice uh, UVs, but I personally do them in Maya. Okay. Just as a, as a quick aside, there is someone in the chat by the name of Ghosts of Christmas Future. And they did mention that there are only so many so many ways you can skin a Santa. <laughs> oh God! I don't I don't know how that happened. I don't know how in the in the world of live streaming we were able to talk about a chocolate Santa, and then somebody who He's went on Twitch and made a username that had to do with Christmas <laughs> also made that comment. You know, I mean, it's, it's quite 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 amazing. So he haunted um, today three times. Yeah. Yeah. So you did some kiting in the demo, and would you oh, recommend right. any good books or tutorials on best practices for retopology? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you said books, and I was like, ugh, books. Uh, no, no books. Don't reading. Uh, I'm um, in the library right now. Come on. <laughs> no, reading's on. great, but um, there's so much out there. So what's great about like the world we live in now um, is that. Most art, I mean, I guess I'm one of them now. Um, most artists have tutorials out there because they want to get their stuff out there. It's another form of media that they can kind of show their stuff. So like every, Gumroad, pay 10 bucks. And the guy's like, here's everything I know about UV layout. Here's Or like whole YouTube channels that are specifically designed around teaching. So Flipped Normals is a really good channel, I think is what it's called. Um, and you just kind of, if you do Flipped Normals, UVs, it'll pop up. But there's a there's a bunch of YouTubers out there who uh, have incredible content that kind of explain things perfectly well. And My, also the Nomen Workshop, which I should have said first. <laughs> That's what I was gonna. I was gonna go like my favorite place to go. Now here's here's the thing. Oh, no. on, on the Nomen Workshop, you uh, you and, and before we had our little technical uh, hiccup, you had mentioned this lantern robot. Oh, that, that's right. Uh, you have. Is there a way that, uh, yeah, the, the, the James said the exact same thing. Could we could we take a look at this uh, this fancy this fancy robot that you'd worked on? And I think I I uh, for some reason Fireflies really strike the Last of Us for me Ooh, because yeah. if you've ever played that game, uh, Ellie mentions Fireflies and, and totally Ipad, yeah. And I'm Fireflies watching this show now, but I played I also played the game too, but which is amazing by the way that show is so cool the 
the the props and it, like everything's real it's great mm -hmm. <clears throat> not yeah, really real, it's, but, you know. yeah it's really good and almost as good as this lantern robot that you had uh, on the normal workshop see i did it that one i did it that time. Yeah, i do i i do want to preface <laughs> i will say that like the no one workshop is a cut above the rest i mean these are paid professionals that are like they go over the curriculum they make sure it's right so and it's also it's kind of like this might be a bad comparison but it's kind of like netflix so like you open up the no one workshop you pay you know a monthly fee or whatever it is and then you have this trove of all this information it's it's amazing. I mean, I literally met people who are like, I learned how to 3D just from the Nomen Workshop. And I'm like, holy cow, that's amazing. So, okay. And the other thing right now is that if somebody wants to learn from your workshop, and I know we said it earlier, yes, make sure to uh, check out this discount code. It expires on February 15th. So DZ20. And then, uh, I mean, look, so 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 walk us through this real quick. I'm, I'm, very, cool. I'm very curious of what I'm looking at. Um, so it's called sculpting with Z modeler. This is a robot, um, but it does have a lot of natural shape. It has fingers and arms and all this other stuff, and there are a lot of organic shapes. Um, so I thought it was a good model or concept to go off. It's by Ann Dang. She did an incredible job on this concept, um, and she also did skins for Overwatch, which I thought was really cool, like designing them and stuff, which we talked about that we both or I like Overwatch. Anyway, <clears throat> we did talk about that, yeah, but we we'll, did, we'll, yeah. we'll come back to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, essentially when I'm going through this project, it's not just me doing a sleeve. I mean, I'm going through every single piece, looking at the concept and then being like, okay, where do we start? Um, let's make sure it matches the concept because that's huge for me. Um, because, and then like another aside is that uh, like that's, so when you're making a portfolio for a character artist or any other 3D position, your job is to take a concept and realize it in 3D. Um, so a huge thing for me is actually matching the concept. And there's a lot of that in this too. So it's kind of like my first, so I, I did two known workshops. The first one was a matching a stylized concept in 3D. And then this one, which is uh, sculpting in Z modeler. And this is kind of like a part two, but we pretty much only use Z modeler to do this, which I, I thought was pretty cool. Um, and so, yeah, there's all kinds of shapes in here. I, I even use bullying, bullying, um, really technical stuff, really advanced going. Like this was something that this wasn't retopologized. I went in there and like modeled all these shapes in there. Um, like I talked about splitting a vert, right? So this like cavern that you see here that I'm kind of hovering over, this started as just like a flat face cylinder with a vert that I placed correctly, split it open, cut it out closed it up you know what i mean like it was kind of like um, yeah like an engineer or something or a, i don't know, like i'm modeling a car or something i think i finally figured out what i like about this robot specifically is that <laughs> it has all the good things of bastion without all those annoying people <laughs> that just turn into a turret and hit in the back with mercy you know what i'm saying like it doesn't have any of that it's just a cool looking robot that's why I like doing 3D because it's kind of like I get to make the Overwatch characters without um, people yelling at me or me yelling at kids. <laughs> so it's it's good. It's good. I shouldn't be on there anyway, to be honest. <laughs> so if anyone's curious about the Nomen Workshop, we actually have an awesome trailer explaining what it's about Ooh. and where you can go. So let's take a look at that right now. Hello, my name is Daniel. And I want to welcome you to my Nomen workshop. In this course, I will teach you how to use Z Modeler as efficiently as possible. I've been working in the film, games, and consumer products world for about six years now. And uh, one thing that has completely changed my workflow is Z Modeler.
Good God. They make that seem so cool. Thank you, Nomad Workshop, for making me feel like a badass. Holy cow. <laughs> I got to say, it's very impressive every time I watch you live read that. That was really good. That was that was phenomenal. <laughs> really good job. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the speed at which you made that sculpt was phenomenal. It was really really good job. That's how fast I go. So that's literally um, how fast uh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Just joking. So um, did have a question that actually kind of relates to what we just saw. But okay. do you have any tidbits or like little you know uh, tips that you can give? for when you sculpt so precisely from other artists' concepts? Oh, oh, yes, I do. Um, I'm trying to see if I could show an example here. Oh, I'm clicking on the stream. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to... I don't have a concept right now, but I'm going to pretend I have a concept. Okay. So hopefully this works. Perfect. Okay. So pretend this is a robot or something. Okay. I did it again. I went too fast. OK, so let me explain. Um, I use something called uh, the Spotlight tool. And so what you do is you bring, you load, sorry, you import a texture or the concept art, right? And mm -hmm. then you click this to add the Spotlight, and it brings the image onto your screen. And then you have all these tools, and that's a lot of that's in my class. Um, but I use this, and I, I literally I, I turn down the opacity, OK? And I line up the concept with it. This is so bad because I don't have like the actual concept. But imagine that there's like a drawing of, you know, imagination. Like, imagination. It is. And then what I'll do is I'll I'll usually start with a sphere. So, like, let's just append this. Well, now why do you why do you start with a sphere specifically? That's a good question. Like all the shapes that you could start with, do you feel most comfortable with that or? Um, because uh, uh, this is gonna sound stupid. Oh yes, so it's because a square you can't quite see all the angles, and this gives me like I can. It's very smooth, so I can see angles turning. I could see more three quarters of what's happening. Where a cube, mm -hmm. it's like if so, like right now, I can see the edge turning, right? Like I can see mm -hmm. the left side of the sphere. So what I do um, is I I will line up. The concept as large as I can, and then usually it has a face because I'm a character modeler, right? Um, and I'll find the eyes, and I know that the line in the middle of this sphere is the middle of my guy's face, right? And so I'll line it up and I'll rotate it into place like this, and I'll make sure that it's matching. I, I, there's no concept there, but let's pretend, right? Um, right, right, right. The thing is that this model, I'm not moving the model at all. I'm moving the camera. Um, and so oh. what I'll do is I'll I'll do go to document, uh, Z app link, and then I'll do custom one for example. So okay, so I have it lined up right. It's all there. I have the sphere, and what I'll do is I'll turn on symmetry and I'll start doing what I do right. I'll sculpt, I push it, blah blah, blah whatever. This is right in the center. This is there's like this is center right here. Mm -hmm. I haven't moved the sphere at all. So I'm moving whatever, and then I go back and I check it. Boom! It snapped back to exactly where the concept was and the angle of where the guy was looking. Um, so that's that's my tip. That's how I match concepts perfectly. Because one thing I learned really quickly is never trust your eyes. Because, like for example, if I said, "Hey, Chris, um, model or sorry, mo draw a broom." or draw a TV, you will draw what you think that might look like. But if right. then I then I give you reference of whatever TV is, you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot this, I forgot that, I forgot this, all this stuff. Um, and so I never trust myself. I line up the concept. I see how far is the eye from the ear? How big is this guy's actual forehead? I'm measuring, I'm making these decisions because I'm a professional. I don't have time to guess and do all these things. I need to make sure I get it right the first time. Yeah, and right the first time you do. I mean, it, uh, if you're if you're curious, and I'm talking mainly to the chat here, if you are curious on exactly how he does that with the model that we just saw, of course, to the Noman workshop that we've been talking about this whole time, um, <laughs> somebody did comment in the chat if this was going to be a new Pathfinder skin. Uh, for those of you, I'm sure everyone knows, but for anyone that plays a video game Apex. from Apex Legends, and how amazing would that be as a Pathfinder skin? Just as, as, in, 
as an aside, um, make sure that if you want to check out some of Daniel's stuff, to uh, give him a follow on on, on Instagram, Art by Zenny. But Daniel, if they want to check out more of your stuff, where where would they go? Uh ArtStation. I love ArtStation. It's a great portfolio website. I guess I'm kind of like selling that too, but ArtStation.com slash Daniel Zenny. And that is the portfolio that I send to studios, personal portfolio. There's also a professional reel that can't be in the public, but that is where all my personal work goes. I show uh, wireframes. I show gray models. I show everything. That's awesome. Oh, of course, Albert. Don't even worry about it. And uh, so we have some more questions. If you're if you're ready for some more questions, yeah, hit me. Yeah, let's go. You, you get sense. up. You ready to yeah. get your steps in? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the questions, and and I, this is going to be a common one, but the quickest way to pick up ZBrush, and do you have to learn every aspect of the uh, software, or is there some fast track tutorial? Now, I just want to take a second. Daniel did at the beginning of this stream show us in Z Modeler only a few things that you need to know in order to do some pretty awesome stuff. Um, now, there, there, I'm sure there's a base knowledge of, of ZBrush as well, but if you haven't, make sure you, you save this so then when you learn that ZBrush stuff, then you have a little bit of Z Modeler backup. You know, we're just offering you you free stuff over here, over here at Nomen, just trying to help out. But Quickest way to pick up ZBrush. What what would you say? I'd Nomen? say to not do <laughs> what I'm doing. Um, well, yeah, I mean, go to Nomen. Just go to Nomen, honestly. <laughs> I'm I'm being I'm being serious because like okay, two year program. Before I graduated, I was ready to get a job. I I was hired. It was crazy. I didn't know if I went before before Nomen and I said Daniel with like 22 year old Daniel. I said Daniel, what's 3D? I'd be like I. What do you, I don't I don't know I have no idea I literally didn't know what it was anyway, um, but I, I can give you like a quick like you could use ZBrush and not know anything about topology. Um, you can make sculpts; they just won't be like ready for animation or games. They might be ready for like consumer products. Um, and so the what you can do is just get a sphere or something to model in. On, uh, can I just get a regular? Can we go back? Uh, where's oh, my whatever. spheres ah god i got this like weird alien thing okay just mm -hmm. divide it up a bunch a bit smooth complete lower and then dynamesh and this will give you um oh uh, is there oh it tricked me dynamic subdiv can be tricky see because i it thought that i had more topology than i did and it came out all nasty like that okay not nasty but uh, faceted okay so i dynameshed it and now this is what the topology looks like it's gross. It's really not important. Um, but then you can grab like sculpting tools. Like you can grab the clay brush, um, and you could just oh, this is another one. Sorry, spotlight projection. We're getting a we're getting a first hand right here. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm enjoying this. this is <laughs> you could do this, and you can practice your sculpting chops, right? Like you don't need to understand topology. You don't need to use Z modeler and all that stuff. In fact, I'd say it's it'd be very strange. If you're like, I'm a Z modeler master, but I, that's all I do. I don't know how to sculpt. That'd be really strange. So I would say <laughs> if you've never used ZBrush before, get in here and just start sculpting. The, ZBrush is the best sculpting program out there. Uh, there really is no competition. I feel comfortable saying that, but if you ask me what the best modeling program is, I would be a little bit scared because I wouldn't want to piss people off. But I think most people would agree that ZBrush is like the titan when it comes to um, sculpting. And then just play around the brushes. I mean, there's all kinds of fun brushes in here. Um, that you can play with. And you just, uh, and there, and there, there and there is Chris. <laughs> that looks exactly like me. Wow. How did you I got do the that? nose right. That's perfect. This looks like look at my, that. Uh, this you looks got like my entrance portfolio to Nomen, actually. That's crazy. You know, I mean, I, what, what did that take? Two minutes to get a lifelike sculpture of me. Boom. <laughs> oh my God. This is normal size of my eyeballs, too. I'm loving this. <laughs> this is great. Uh, and I, would buy, I would buy like a um, a hundred dollar Wacom tablet or something. I think I have one here. Hopefully, it doesn't break everything. Uh, okay, this is a this is like a small Wacom tablet. I think it's like a hundred dollars to get it from Best Buy. Because um, don't do what I do. I I like sculpt and model with a mouse, and I just got used to it. Um, and I like it. I do have a Cintiq that's like right off camera, and I love using it to sculpt. 
um, but I tend to kind of do what I showed there where I'm really like modeling while sculpting. Um, but yeah, get get a little tablet, start sculpting away. You don't need to, this, it's, this is probably good. Well, and then if you want to learn model, like then I would jump into like Maya first. If you don't understand topology, jump into one of the core modeling softwares that are out there because if you if you like if you went to a studio and they're like do you know how to model and be like yes what program do you use i, I just use z modeler i actually don't know how to use maya they'd be like that's really strange <laughs> so so <laughs> learn learn topology in maya learn um the basics first and those and then jump in here but then sculpting right so use this to learn how to sculpt use maya to learn how to model and then once you get those in your brain jump back here and be like let's let's do some z modeler so i guess this is kind of an intermediate tool to use yeah, but the it seems like the basic uh, starting point is like just play around with it, like yeah. literally, like just having a piece of clay. Exactly. Like just hop in and, and see, you know, if just you're a, even interested in it. Just turn on this polyframe thing. If if there's not a lot of lines, divide it up so you get some more. Like that's keep that's, dividing. Keep dividing. There's not there's all kinds of there's sculptures pro where like it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so here's another one. Can you save your Spotlight and Zaplink cameras in ZBrush in case your ZBrush crashes? You absolutely can. Uh, if you go okay. to Texture, you can save Spotlight, and it'll save it as a dot WS or something. Actually, I'm not sure what it saves it as. I think actually, I think it's like a Z tool thing. Uh, and then in Document Z app Properties, you can also save these yeah. using. This one has a weird like dot VW. It, it looks like a weird file, uh, but when you load it, it'll come up just like this. And uh, this is actually how you um, present models and stuff for toys, or that's at least how I would do it, is you kind of line things up. You do front, automatically do the back. Do, oops. You do right, you do back. And then when you press um, make character sheet, it'll open it up in Photoshop. It'll ladle out all beautiful. That's a little extra thing, I guess, but. <laughs> a little, little bit extra for you. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'm and just then like, how do you how do you keep the Z modeler topology clean when combining subtools? Example, combining a torso with a sleeve. Oh, well, um, so for example, I have uh, these two pieces here. Um, and I wonderful self portrait. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> this is um, the best. <laughs> So I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out a way to answer this question because I think I see what this person's asking. Um, but as long as they have their own poly groups, this is clean. Like technically speaking, I could still isolate the eye if I click on avert. Um, and I could still isolate the head, right? Um, and even if I didn't have poly groups, even if these all had the same poly groups, you could still use ZModeler to uh, poly group the island, which is the eye. And then you can get those polygroup back, or you could split to parts. Like I wouldn't worry too much about combining things. The only thing that can happen on accident um, is you know how I used a Dynamesh to give myself more topology. If you do that with multiple shells as the same subtool, uh, they will melt together. So, and that's Sculptures Pro, what you just saw there, which is um, live adapting topology. It's crazy. Yeah, that's for another day. So yeah, so you don't really have to worry about like keeping objects clean while they are the same subtool or separating them as long as you don't accidentally dynamesh them together. I have one. Okay. Here. So questions, they're they're coming in again. If if you guys haven't put in your question, it's a last chance for questions, uh, last call for alcohol. That's a song <laughs> reference. I don't know why I said that, but I like listening to music from time to time. Heck so yeah. uh, as we go into this a little bit more, do you have any advice for beginner character artists? Like, boy, I mean, what do you think is kind of the, the most difficult thing when you first were getting into it, right? Like you, yeah. you did that whole thing where you're gonna work for Gentle Giant and you were like, okay, well, my environments have these statues in it and all that. And then getting into character art, I mean, that was quick shift. Right. So what was the difficulty? What are kind of like the downfalls that were, you know, immediate? And then how do you kind of work with that? Well, so I, I uh, sculpted for toys for like three and a half years. Um, and so I got a lot of sculpting chops. And that's essentially where I got good at Z modeler. And I had, you know, I sculpted um, 
the official toy line for Pokemon, and I got art direction from Nintendo, and they are super strict. So that that's that is where I learned how to match a concept because I had to. That being uh. said, when I would apply to animation studios, they'd be like, "You don't have production experience. We don't know if you're good with topology." Even though your personal projects show that you're good at topology, even though you've been sculpting for years, you have more actual sculpting experience than like a regular character modeler would have. Mm -hmm. You need to have that production. So that's the hardest part is that they want you to have that experience already. And it's very difficult to get into an animation studio because there are there are indie games and there are smaller game studios, but for animation, there are really only the hot shots. Um, and so my suggestion would be to get on a short film. Don't worry about pay. I know a lot of people say you should get paid for that stuff, but like do it to get a nice, strong portfolio piece. If you can show a studio that you work together on a team recreating the production pipeline, it looks so good for you. Okay. Okay. That's actually some really good advice. We'll, let's back up just for a second because I'm curious. Favorite Pokemon. Actually, everybody in the chat, if you're hearing this, and you like Pokemon. I, I'm very curious what your favorite Pokemon is. Um, I have a pretty big head. So it's in the category of the ones that I made. If I sculpted it, okay. then, it then it's in the running for my favorite. I love that. I think that's great. Um, but I think I think Loudred was one of the ones that I sculpted. And it was just really Loudred. cool because it's like a sound Pokemon. And he's got these cool arms. Uh, very nice. Tinkatan. Oh, and Gengar. Because um, when you squished his head, Good his choice. tongue would come out. Which is, oh, that's really awesome! Fun. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. so now I run around. I go to Targets, and like my girlfriend will be doing normal adult things. And I'm like, I gotta go to the toy <laughs> section to see if my Pokemon are here. <laughs> so. Good time. We got Meryl. Meryl, man, I remember when Meryl came out. I am a fan of uh, Bulbasaur. I love Bulbasaur, but I also love Esper and Mimikyu. Uh, okay. So you know, that's just the that's just a little side note. Sorry, we we kind of went off there. Everyone watching, yeah, I sorry. appreciate. But that was a huge part of my uh, my career was that I, I sculpted those Pokemon toys, and it, it really kind of pushed me forward. That's awesome. I mean, how how fun to be able to do something like that. Just, I, I can't. You know, I I mean, I can't imagine because to me this is really fun. I love it. You know, talking to people that right, do yeah. what you do. You know, so that's great. Okay, sorry. More questions. Okay. Uh, thank you all, everyone watching, for putting up with us and asking these excellent <laughs> questions. I also want to know the answers to these, too. Um, so we got some advice. Now, how long does it take you usually to finish a full character uh, separated? So let's say that uh, on a production level, generally, what's like the deadline that they give you to finish a character? And then on a personal level, when are you like, I'm, I'm done with this character? Um, so I, first I'm going to start with how long Noman wants you to do it for. Okay. Um, and I think, I think it was like a project every two weeks and whether it was a character or a full scene. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's like AI talking. Um, <laughs> yeah, my, my watch randomly. <laughs> um, so I think it was like two weeks, no matter what it was, um, and here's the thing, it's, it's a more complex question than you think, because a lot of times when you're working at a studio, they have a base mesh. Um, so there's already a character that exists, and so you're really just taking that character and like pushing, like sculpting with Z model, like, huh? like you're moving around the existing topology, not editing it at all, and making sure that it stays the same, but changing the face and changing the length and stuff, because they don't want to make a rig for every character, right? Because that would take very long. So what they can do is right. make small edits where like things stay exactly where they are, but it's a mm -hmm. different character. And then suddenly it's so that being said, if it's a character like that, if you're doing like a background character or something, they might give you a week or three days to like model the clothes, change the hair, whatever it is. Um, but for example, I worked on a, um, a Mattel show through Mind Show, which is really cool. They use VR to animate the characters. It's pretty cool. Um, but I was there from the beginning, and I helped them realize the actual characters. So that was different. It was actually a much longer process because we were trying to figure out what, what should these girls look like. There's a toy version. There's an illustrated version. So there's a lot of back and forth. And then finally, we, we you know, okay, like let's make this topology nice and then move forward. So... I would say most of the time they'll probably give you a week, but you also have a lot to work with, right? Like you'll reuse a lot of things. That's a huge part of this is uh, I think kit bashing is the word you use for like mechs and stuff. Uh, but there's mm -hmm. also kit bashing for characters too. Cause you're like, Oh, um, 
uh, guy B has this hair and it's pretty similar to guy L that I'm working on. So let me grab that and I'll pull this and okay, I'm already halfway there. Oh, Keep and bashing, personal... I, I... go ahead, go ahead. Oh, so, so but personal characters, um, it, it depends because, but I, so I will also use a base mesh. That's something I did wrong was when I was a student, which I don't know if it's wrong or not, but um, you should reuse as much as you can. When you're practicing, when you're learning, like obviously you should practice anatomy, practice sculpting, but when you're on a time crunch and you need to do a, a like a, a character in a whole scene, don't make your own facial topology. Don't like, like find a base mesh that you like. And you, especially if you're doing stylized characters, right? Like don't make a new, base mesh every time that's crazy just make your first character and then use it as much as you can edit it change it whatever it's your toolkit it, that was actually i i had seen that uh, the first time at lbx uh jared krzyzewski uh creature corner on tuesdays he showed me that he has a, a file of all of these different sculpts that he had made as like base sculpts right so he didn't have to remake them and then I was like, oh, well, then everything's going to look the same. And then, nope, sure enough, he brought it in and it looked like this war mutated alien thing. If anyone's interested in that, it's on our Instagram live uh, on our Instagram at Noman School. Um, but boy, it's it's really uh, very interesting to see that kind of morph, right? Well, even totally. though it's a base sculpt and, and, and base, you can really do a lot with it, which is really cool. Totally. He was actually my creature teacher at Nomen. And then wow. his co-host, Matt Miller, was one of my best buddies at Nomen. We would go drinking, hang out. We were, But we were very opposite, right? Like, I liked Disney stylized, and he was like, Hellraiser's my favorite movie. And so that's I loved yeah. um, th Those are great guys. He was your teacher? Yeah, Jerry Krzyzewski. And I was like, oh I don't gosh. like horror, and I don't like gross things, can I? And he was like, oh, I hate this kid. Yeah, he, he must have... <laughs> He must really believe in horror movies or something, because that dude has he's not amazing. aged then. There's no way. He looks <laughs> amazing. So he's, total he's an incredible line. artist, for real. He's, oh. I mean, he, he does a demo every term. I don't know if he still does it. But it's like, I think if you go on his art station, you could see every year. And I can go back, like, 15. Uh, I don't want to age him that much. But, like, I don't know, six or seven um, projects. And I'll find the one that he did for our class. And it is incredible to be able to do a live demonstration over a course and, like, have it look that good. He's, he's insane. Yeah, I mean, to me, y'all are incredible. Oh, so, thank you. You know. Uh, okay, so full character. We have even more questions. Wow, these questions are really coming in. Really? Uh, when days get tough during school or work, what keeps you going? So that's going to, that's definitely a, a, I think that'll hit with every artist, right? Like there's going to, yeah. that happens all the time where you're just like, dude, I'm not feeling it today. Or, you know, any, any of that stuff, your pen hits the, page and the second that happens you're just like nope it's not there so what what kind of uh stuff do you do in situations like that no one was a bit different um it was a much more extreme environment i would say um but you had each other that was the difference right like if if we were struggling if we you know we were there okay so like the labs would open at 9 a.m and they would close at 1 a.m and we would all be there like the whole time uh but if you saw someone was stressed out, you'd be like hey let's go to brazil kiss which is a cafe let's go get let's go get a coffee let's go get you know an acai bowl or whatever let's like blow off some steam <laughs> and then like let's get back to it um and just riffing off each other and being like hey can someone come look at this project I'm, I'm stuck on it can you give me some advice getting up looking at other people's projects so that is a huge part of the argument of should you go to school or not is like you are surrounded by like-minded people when i where i was grew up like I don't know anybody around me that does anything that like what I do. No one is in VFX. No one's really an artist. Um, and so when I would talk about this stuff, they'd be like, oh, you know, that's neat. Like people do that somewhere. And then I went to Nomen and suddenly it's like you go to a party and it's some guys like I, I wrote for the Emmys and I, you know, oh, I, I'm the head director of this. And you're just like, wow. So the pond gets bigger. Right. And so anyway, I'm rambling. But no, that that is actually a really exciting point. Uh, well, I mean, just a, a very good point. Like when I started here, um, I talked to uh, Alex Alvarez, the owner and founder of, of Nomen. And um, one of the first things that we had a conversation about was Elden Ring. And it was like, oh, oh, we're the Love same. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're literally the same. And everyone and starts so weird. The same, yeah. yeah, from the top. All the way to the the bottom, the student that just started, you know, the, the last term or whatever, 
they you know they're talking about destiny or any of these things like it's all that community is all blended here it's it's really fun to be here i must say <laughs> well, well like when, when i was a student i i still feel the same way that i did as a student i just have more experience i would go to these live streams and these live events and i would be too scared to go and up and talk to the artists because i thought they're way too good they would never want to talk to me um and now that i'm i guess a professional or whatever i i'm like oh why did i do that like yeah, everyone started as a student. Like, did you think I just came out of the womb? And like, did I really think Jared Krasavsky came out of the womb and he was just like sculpting <laughs> monsters? Like, no, he was a kid who, you know, watched Candyman as a kid or something. And he liked, you know what I mean? Like, they're, yeah. they're just normal people that have hobbies and we like the same things. Well, from what I know about Jared, he was part of some summoning ritual of a cult. And that's why he has all the yeah. skills that he does. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, why he is who <laughs> he is. Um, so... I, this may seem a little bit cliche, but at what point in your career um, did you go like, ah, I made it? Or is, as time goes on, does does that statement evolve? So like, oh, I made it, but now I want this. Or, or have you right. not gotten there yet? Um, I've... I mean, I've I've done a lot of cool things, all with the one goal of being in animation. I want to be in feature animation. That's where I've always wanted to be, or always wanted to be. But, um, but I've but like on the way, I've hit these like, I never, I never, ever, ever thought sculpting Pokemon. But to work on Star Wars and to work on the main, I never thought I would be able to do that. I wasn't even going for it. I was just working really hard, trying to be the best artist I could to get my dream, which was animation. Um, but to say when I made it, um, Mandalorian, I mean, I, but credits at the end of it and then being there at work, uh, when I walked in, I, so I got to, one of the things I got to do was I got to be the digital artist on the Bantha, which is, they're everywhere. They're the big elephant in Star Wars. Um, and at Legacy Effects, they have the offices where the computers are, and then they have the floor, which is, I think is what they called it, which is all the practical effects, the engineering, the molding, the painting, the scuffing up and to walk out to this like foam elephant that they had um, done a 3D process where they make big things out of my sculpt. And then a week or two later walk out and it's like, there's hair and there's texture, it's real. And it's a surreal size elephant you know, thing from what's crazy. Or like I got to model, I got to be on the team that modeled the dark trooper and to walk outside and see the six foot monster of like a Star Wars trooper dude. If that That's when I really said, damn, like I'm here, I'm in LA and I'm, I'm like, I'm killing it, you know, but I, no one like instills in you this draw. Like I will never stop pushing. Like, I don't think there will ever be a time where I'll be like, I'm comfortable, but to be honest, like this, this industry has a lot of layoffs and contracts do end, but it's good because if I never got laid off from uh, general giant, if the pandemic had never happened, I would have stayed put where I was and I would have never grown, but because I was pushed out of my comfort zone, which this, for example, is out of my comfort zone. I've never streamed before. I would have never grown and pushed forward and got better at those things. And I realized that every time I moved, I learned a little bit. I, I got paid a little bit more. I got a little more respect. I got a little more seniority, if that makes sense. So it's a great, crazy, wild industry, and I'm so glad that I'm doing it. Because if not, I think the last thing I did was I was delivering pizza right before, making like four bucks an hour. So I'm just super happy. Well, I mean, hey, free pizza. So I mean, working on Star Wars, free pizza. Yeah, it's it's, a, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look for me, I I don't even I don't even know if I would be able to like stand literally. Like I'm wearing a Star Wars sweater right now. I uh, I got the put the art books behind me for for this stream. I probably would have just cried oh, cool. when I saw the bantha, and then just been like, "That's it, I retired, I'm done, I'm good." <laughs> yeah, I mean, w when I first started, they were like, "Come here," and and there's all kinds of stuff that you're not supposed to look at. There's NDAs, but there's one thing that was covered, and they were like, "This is the million dollar baby." It was Baby Yoda, it were, you know, Grogu, which at the time his name wasn't Grogu. We didn't know. And uh, when I saw crazy. that, that's when I was like, "Oh my god, I'm here! I did it! I'm oh my god!" This used to be, you know, whatever. Uh, these guys worked on Jurassic Park. Oh, I, I worked on a droid that the engineer that I was working with, he walks up to me and goes, hey, um, uh, this is so-and-so, this is me, this is what I've worked on. I did the spitter dinosaur in Jurassic Park. And I was like, ha, what did you just say to me? Are you kidding me? So working with amazing people that did stuff that you grew up with is another, yeah. like, oh, my gosh moment. Yeah, I, I, the, yeah the, what was his name? Newman or whatever? I don't know what his actual name is. Knight? Something Knight? The actor that gets spit in the face oh, in Jurassic yeah. Park. 
I just remember that scene so vividly that scared me more than most of the other movie. I mean, it's That's terrifying. terrifying. Yeah. Um, but really good stuff. Uh, okay. Sorry. So can you tell us a little bit about, I know we've been talking about Noman a lot, but as yeah. far as difficulty concerns, Oh, Wayne Knight. Thank you, chat. I appreciate it. That's why y'all are here. Without oh, thank you. you. Yeah, I don't know if have the either, answers but... to these things. I did get the night part right. Um, so the difficulty of Nomen. So you were saying the community really helped you along. And if you got uh, burnt out, you all got together. But yeah. was Nomen difficult? And, and how did you cope with that? How tough is it? Is it tough? Why don't you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> I think I'm like the perfect and maybe the worst person to talk about this. I think you need to grab. Um, I had another friend at Nomen who just he was like hey man why are you stressing out like everything's fine dude and i was like ah! the whole time <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 how you look at it it's how you handle stress um i had never done anything like that before i was essentially coasting through life and then i went to like the toughest best vfx school in the world um and i had a really hard time i actually took a term off halfway through which it was like it was like 3 a.m i'm sitting with max dan out in the parking lot smoking a cigarette i'm so stressed out and i'm like man i need to take a term off and he said the chances of you coming back dude are like super low and i took a term off and i whatever and then i came back and i got like best of term anyway but so you so yeah it's it's very 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 difficult but it's only two years and i still can't i think it's been six years now since i graduated that time felt so long ago and it felt so short, but at the time it felt like such a long time. But if you can sacrifice two, three years of your life, like you can get yourself set up with an amazing career, um, you know, working on this stuff. Where now my day, like compared to Noman, my day to day is nothing. I'm in, I don't wear pants. I, I don't, I, fuck, I just sculpt all day. It's amazing. This is all I do. It's not there, stressful at all, really. <laughs> there's our, there's our new uh, marketing, everyone. Come to Noman, so you don't have to wear pants anymore. Yeah, one day, but you gotta go to class <laughs> with pants on. There it is. You know, wear pants and open, and then once you leave, <laughs> you're totally <laughs> fine. <laughs> oh man. Uh, well, so thank you so much again for uh, joining us on this stream tonight. It's been very fun. Um, again, if people want to know what you're up to, and we don't have you on the stream anytime soon, then how do how do we stay up to date with you? Where do we go? Um, what do we I'm see? I'm pretty consistent on two different uh, apps, and one would be ArtStation, which is ArtStation.com, and then just my name, Daniel Zenny. And then the other one would be my Instagram, which is Art by Zenny. And I, if I do a project, I post both of them there. And then also my LinkedIn. So like, if you're a student and you want to ask me like a professional question, like, hey, how do I get into the street? Just shoot me a message on LinkedIn, and I always answer. But I'll answer on all of them. That's <laughs> awesome. great. Sorry, we're getting uh, people in the chat now commiserating with the sculpting in pajama pants and saying that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the way to go um i do want to remind everybody in the chat that if you get a chance head on over to Noman workshop you can check out daniel's amazing workshops and, and you actually have two right, right. so there's I have two now. modeler and what's the other one oh sorry i just like my brain went somewhere else. It's um, matching a stylized concept in ZBrush, which is a lot of the um, spotlight projection, making sure things, you know, the job. But that's the, the job, job of being a character job. artist. That's what that we're going to start job. calling it, the job. The job. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> from now until February 15th, D's Any 20 gets you a discount on those. Again, February 14th, you know, you know who deserves a Valentine's Day gift? You. You deserve a Valentine's Day gift. So why don't you go ahead and get yourself a Valentine's Day gift? Go ahead and head over to Noma Workshop. I mean, I think even Daniel, why don't you buy your own workshop? And then watch I'm going to use my own code right there. That's going to be nice. I do. I, I'm, I'm telling you, like, I, I'm always brushing up on stuff. I'm, I never stop learning. Yeah, that's great. And for anyone that wants to find out what Noman can do for you, go ahead and send us an email at admissions at nomen.edu uh, we love starting a conversation and try and help people on their artistic journey so go ahead and send us an email and if you haven't turned into any of our streams we have two streams on tuesdays as well as a great stream on friday so make sure to subscribe to us and check out our other amazing streams 
And maybe I'll see you soon, Daniel. Maybe we'll see you soon. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. I love talking about Noman because it was an amazing school and also kind of sharing a little bit of my knowledge. This is a lot of fun, Chris. Thanks. Oh, and thank you to the Noman thank Workshop. You. Thank you, Noman. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are wonderful. And thank all of you <laughs> in the chat. We'll, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.